Buenas noches, hermanos y amigos. Mi nombre es David Barnes. Soy el rector de los Centros Teológicos Bautistas, uh, un seminario en el Perú que provee educación teológica para líderes uh, de las iglesias evangélicas uh, en el Perú y en el mundo entero. Uh, conmigo está el doctor Jim Panayo, uno de nuestros profesores. Y esta noche tenemos uh, un tiempo muy especial. Tenemos un tremendo privilegio de tener con nosotros al doctor uh, Tomás Schreiner. Uh, Tomás Schreiner es profesor de interpretación del Nuevo Testamento y de teología bíblica en Southern Baptist Theological Seminary um, en los Estados Unidos, donde labora desde hace 23 años. Es uno de los comentaristas y teólogos más reconocidos en el mundo entero. Ha escrito numerosos comentarios del Nuevo Testamento, uh, además de muchos otros libros sobre temas teológicos muy diversos, de gran importancia para la Iglesia, que han sido una gran bendición para mi propia vida. Good evening, Dr. Schreiner. Thank you for agreeing to meet with us uh, in this way and share some of your knowledge and your experience with us and with our, our students. Well, it's wonderful uh, to be with you on uh... David and, and with, with the others via, via Zoom. It's, uh, I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom. Uh, Jim and I are going to alternate with questions for you this evening. So I'll hand over to Jim for the first question tonight. Thank you, David. Uh, Dr. Schreiner, you've written uh, a wide variety of books on a wide variety of topics throughout the years, co commentaries on Romans and Hebrews and First and Second Peter and Jude and a New Testament theology, uh, all the way to books on the law, spiritual gifts, baptism, and a host of other topics. Um, out of all these projects, which of them have been most rewarding for you and why? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say it's been such a privilege to uh, have the time to write. I mean, obviously, to be in an institution at Southern and Bethel before that where I had time to write is a great gift. Not everybody has that gift in terms of their schedule, so I'm very, very grateful for that. Obviously, I like writing commentaries. I've, you know, I've written several. I'm actually working on a very uh, detailed commentary right now on the book of Revelation. Um, so we'll see, we'll see, uh, when I, when or if I finish that, I hope so. I look so. forward to that. I taught on Revelation just uh, a couple of months back and, um, I'm always in look on, on lookout for new commentaries. It's such a difficult book. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a long, it's a long process. Uh, as I've gotten into it, I, I've wondered sometimes if I were wise to get into it, but here, here I am. But you know, if I choose... It, that, it's actually a very hard choice, but I think maybe my favorite book that I wrote was The King and His Beauty. Beca and, I, and I enjoyed writing that book so much because I was putting together the whole Bible. How do I understand the, the, the whole of Scripture? And, you know, I got to interact with the Old Testament books as well. Um, So I, I like writing theology uh, as well. I, I suppose the second would be my book on Paul, which I just published a new edition of that. My second edition of it just came out uh, a couple months ago of uh, Paul Apostle of God's, whatever it's called, Paul Apostle of God's Glory in Christ. I can't remember the exact title. Um, so that was, uh, I loved writing that book the first time and the second edition it was really enjoyable as well. I, th I think, you know, why would that be? Why would I enjoy those books a bit more? I think it's because when I'm working on commentaries, which I love doing, but mm. there's so much detailed work that there are moments in the commentary writing where I think, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it becomes so detailed, whereas I'm, these books are more broadly expositional. So it, there wasn't as, quite as much... Um, detailed work although it everything i've worked on feeds into it one what, what would you say the the additions important most important additions were or changes in your book on on your commentary on romans that you brought out after 20 years what why what what need did you see for adding to that 
Well, so for one thing, you know, publishers, publishers basically only keep commentaries in print 20 years now. Okay. So, you know, the first edition was 1998. If my commentary was going to have a continued shelf life, I really need, in, at least in the U.S., I needed to do another edition. Secondly, I could, you know, 20 years later, and I, now I don't remember exactly because it's been a little bit since I've worked on Romans, but there were 20, I believe, around 20 major commentaries published since mine, hmm. amazingly enough. So, and then articles and monographs keeping up on the research. And then um, I wanted to say some things, uh, you know, I, I mean, there are some areas where I nuanced a bit what I'd said before on the righteousness of God, um, on Romans 2, 14 and 15, Romans 7. So Did you change I, your, your view on Romans 7? Well, I have over the years, back and forth a bit. Okay. <laughs> but actually, I changed. I changed a bit in between the writing of my commentary. By the time I came back to writing my commentary, it was pretty similar to what I wrote the first time. Okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't really dramatically different. So, but it was, I, you know, I learned so much. I, by the way, I just finished a revision. I'm, I'm at that age where I'm revising. I, I revised first, second Peter and Jude as well. Hmm. And I, that just came out the other day. And, uh, and, uh, that was really enjoyable to come back to. I love those books. And, uh, and again, take into account recent research. If someone were to say to me, did you change your mind dramatically on anything in that, those, that commentary? Maybe details, but no. I didn't change my mind on anything really in a dramatic way. But just to rephrase things, mm -hmm. maybe... Sometimes I said things in my youthful uh, enthusiasm that I wanted to moderate a little bit or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah interesting, I, Dr. Schreiner, you, you mentioned that uh, just in this little conversation several times that you've, um, in a sense, con continued learning things that you have as a scholar you've written on, been published on. Um, sometimes we, we hear in, in the, in the um, classroom students say, well, I already took that course, or I've already done that, as though finishing a course or finishing a program of discipleship means I've reached the goal. Um, from what I'm hearing from you, uh, your learning, even as a, as a renowned scholar, is something that is continuous. It's something you're always going back, even to some of the most basic things, and re, uh, you know, re-studying, re-learning. Uh, could you just speak a little bit to that, uh, the importance of that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I would say the what what excites me so much about writing. I hope it's a help to others. But when I write and research, I learn the most, mm -hmm. and I recognize after studying many years, I never get to the end. I don't think anybody ever gets to the end. No one ever masters Romans or any mm -hmm. book of the Bible. There's always more to learn. None of us ha has arrived. Now, that doesn't mean we don't know anything. I'm not saying, you know, I'm a relativist about what Romans is teaching. I think that the message of Romans is clear. But, but, but there's always more riches in God's Word. There's more light in God's Word. And, and situations change. Right. When I, I mean, one example I think of in First Peter 3, the uh, admonition to the wives to submit to their husbands, I considered more in this second edition the issue mm. of how does that apply to abuse? Mm. I didn't cover that at all in my first edition in 2003 or what I think is the first edition. But, you know, the kind of the current questions made me think I should, I should think about that. And it, ironically enough, I'm not, I'm a complementarian, I'm conservative, but I actually learned um, there were some feminist writers on First Peter, hmm. whom I would disagree significantly, even on details of interpretation. But I learned some things reading, reading them that were helpful put into a complementarian framework. So, 
you know, new situations as well help us to look at text in, uh, in a fresh way. Mm -hmm. Sure. Great That's great. Um, Tom, who would you say would have been some of your major influences, both in your theology and in your, your ministry um, over the years? Yeah. Well, you know, if I could start, I'll start. I, I, I was raised, I'm these uh, sixth of eight kids from uh, outside of uh, Salem, Oregon, right above California, if you don't, if some of your hearers don't know where that is. And I grew up in a Roman Catholic family, and I was converted mainly through the person who's become my wife in high school. So, um, you know, we didn't know at the time that we would end up getting married, but her witness uh, brought me to Christ in high school. And then, you know, he's not well known. He's with the Lord now, but my youth pastor mm. had a massive influence on me at the beginning. From the beginning, I had lots of questions. Um, you know, that's just the way God made me. And he was an incredible resource uh, for me. So then I went off to seminary. I went to Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. And of course, my teachers there shaped and formed me in profound ways. Mm. Everybody's different. Uh, seminary for me was like a four-year retreat. <laughs> I, I absolutely, you know, that's the way I'm wired again. I absolutely loved it. I learned so much virtually in every class. Uh, you know, I love taking Greek and Hebrew and systematics and church history and practical ministry. It was, it was, it was amazing. So um, since then, I've taught, just to give you a little history, I taught three years at Azusa Pacific University in Southern California. Then I taught 11 years at Bethel Seminary in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And now I'm in my, I think it's my 24th year mm. at, at Southern. Um, so scholars who have influenced me, uh, Don Carson has had a big influence on me over the years. Don, Don's writings ha, have, uh, are, are in, theologically faithful. He's uh, attuned to biblical theology. Uh, so right from the beginning, I was reading Don. Mm. Uh, J.I. Packer, mm. I read a lot of Packer over the years. I've read a lot of John Frame. I love John Frame, I, and uh, his theological work has helped me. But probably, you know, the, the biggest influence on me, I would, I would have to say for when we were in Minnesota for 11 years, my pastor was John Piper. Okay. And, uh, so, we, you know, when we went there in 1986, John was not nationally known. I read some of his scholarly books, but I actually said to my wife, hey, I've heard of this guy named John Piper. And I said, he's a scholar. You know, I, he had his PhD in New Testament from Munich. Mm -hmm. I said, but I don't know if he's a good preacher. I said, you know, scholars aren't always good preachers. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, he wasn't, you know, now he's well known on the internet, but you know, there was no internet then. And I had no idea, but the minute we heard him, we recognized, no, the Lord's gifted him to preach. And uh, so John, you know, obviously we're separated by distance, but John remains a good friend and his, uh, his love for God's word, his passion for God's glory. Um, I mean, we're very different personalities, but he had a, he had a, profound influence on me so i'm so i'm so grateful for for him yeah he's, he's another one who's had a, a huge impact on the church here in peru and uh on our lives as well um i was talking to jim the other day and on his life on my life as well you know there's some god's really raised up some 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 men who are having a huge impact on the church for for good so that's um that's great uh jim yeah, another question yeah. you have there this is a little more specific, uh, this question, um, but you've stated that you hold to progressive covenantalism. Could you just briefly explain what that means and, and how it differs from other theological systems like covenant theology, dispensationalism? Um, m most of our students probably have heard of dispensationalism. Maybe they've heard of covenant theology. I'm not sure they've heard of progressive covenantalism. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, I think it's helpful if we think of dispensationalism and, and covenant theology first. And, and then, obviously, we could talk about those for a really long time, couldn't we? But I, I think what, are, what, are, what, are, what is the mark uh, of, of dis dispensationalism, the fundamental mark? And I, and I would argue the fundamental mark is the, the distinction, a pretty sharp distinction between Israel and the church. Hmm. So that's what marks dispensational theology. And I was actually trained by dispensationalists. I mean, Western Seminary, when I went to Western Seminary, Western Seminary, and, and they were great and godly and wonderful teachers, but Western Seminary in the 1970s was basically a baby Dallas seminary. Hmm. Uh, all, all the professors, uh, virtually all the professors had graduated from Dallas. So you have that sharp distinction between uh, Israel and the church. So, you know, you've got, you know, you've got your, and typically you've got a pre-trib rapture, a special place for Israel in the millennium, and maybe for some people a special place for, for Israel even in eternity. Mm -hmm. and, and one way that plays out theologically is is the the land promises mm -hmm. uh, given to israel are going to be fulfilled in a literal way for for um, dispensationalists so then over against that covenant covenant theology i mean covenant theology would see more continuity uh theologically between israel and the church it would uh, it would argue that the church is uh, the fulfillment fulfills the promises given to Israel. It would emphasize right one people of God. Um, of course, with covenant theology, you begin with a covenant of works in the garden. Most dispensationalists don't see a covenant of works, although they can. I mean, it gets a little mixed up. But um, so. In, in covenant theology, at least for the sake of this answer, I think uh, the, in classical covenant theology, you see typically an in, uh, emphasis on infant baptism. Mm. You, you, you see an, an emphasis on infant baptism because the, the covenant structure between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the same. So just as circumcision was applied at infancy for uh, the children of the people of God, so should baptism be applied in a similar way. I think that is their best argument, by the way, that, arg that argument from the covenant, the argument mm -hmm. from uh, circumcision. And then the other place it kind of shows up is in terms of the law. Um, so, you know, the Ten Commandments just to cut to the chase, the Ten Commandments represent God's, uh, God's moral will, and, and, and the, what we have is a, a kind of a pretty sharp distinction between the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. And typically in covenant theology, the civil and ceremonial law no longer apply, but um, the moral law does. So, where does progressive covenantalism come in? I think not all progressive covenantalists agree with what I'm about to say. But, but one thing I want to say is, look, this is, a, this is a friendly family discussion. We're trying to put the whole Bible together. That's not easy. We recognize, we recognize we've got faithful people who are dispensationalists, covenant theology, who love the Lord, who love his word. It, we would expect when we're putting the whole Bible together that we're going to have some differences on, on where we cut the cake. But, but then I'd say, I think progressive covenantalism is pretty, pretty close to covenant theology with, with just a few adjustments. I mean, which system is it closer to? I think it's closer to covenant theology, mm -hmm. but it just makes a couple adjustments. So for example, I believe in a covenant of works. I believe, you know, Adam and Jesus are our covenant heads. Uh, Romans 5, Jesus fulfills as the last Adam. He fulfills what um, Adam didn't because he was completely obedient to God. But so, 
So over against dispensationalism as a progressive covenantalist, I see, I see the Church of Jesus Christ as the, res, the restored Israel, the fulfillment of the promises made to Israel. Jews and Gentiles together are in the Church of Jesus Christ, fulfill the promises made to Israel. Now, I mean, at least for me, that doesn't mean there's no future salvation for ethnic Israel. I see a promise of future salvation for Israel in Romans chapter 11 which I take to be an end time salvation of uh, Israel. But here's where I differ from dispensationalists. They'll say there's going to be that end time salvation, then you're going to go into a premillennial scheme, and Israel's going to be the center of the nations. And I think that passage is talking about only the salvation of the Jews, and the Jews who are saved become part of the church of Jesus Christ. They're not, they're, they're not a separate entity, whatever you do with the millennium, in the, in the millennium or, or in eternity. So, so my big difference from uh, dispensationalists is their sharp distinction between Israel and the church is one I, one I don't hold. My, my big difference from covenant theologian comes, comes out in when we talk about baptism. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we relate the covenant made with Abraham, the circumcision that's established there, to the church of Jesus Christ? And I would say, I mean, covenant theologians, in part, they'd agree with what I'd say, but we have to recognize that, the, that Israel was a theocracy. It's a church and a state together. But the church of Jesus Christ is not a theocracy. That is, we're not a state. Mm -hmm. You know, Israel... Israel was a political entity as, as, the, as the people of God. But the church, the church is, consists of people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. You know, the United States is not God's special nation, or, or Peru, right? Or Brazil, or whatever country you want to mention. There are Christians in every, every nation now. So uh, it made sense that the covenantal right was applied to children because you weren't just entering uh, the people of God spiritually, you were entering it politically. You were, a, you were a member of that covenant, that theocratic covenant community. But our, but our covenant community, that is the Church of Jesus Christ, you, you don't enter it by birth, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we don't apply, we don't apply the, covenant, the covenant sign until there's covenant faith. So there's no, there's no remnant within a larger group of people as there was in the Old Testament. That's right. That's right. And, and so, right. And so my understanding of the new covenant differs. You know, that in some ways, I think some covenant theologians don't really understand the newness of the new covenant. Mm. Basically, the new covenant becomes like the old covenant, that you have both believers and unbelievers together in the covenant. But my, my, so, you know, every once in a while, we have a student who's a Baptist who becomes a Presbyterian. I mean, God bless them. I think they're wrong. <laughs> but I say to him every time, I say to him, how does that fit with the new covenant? Your view. Because, because God writes his law, Jeremiah 31, on every member of the new covenant's heart. And so you're, you're saying now that's not true. Because unless you're arguing for baptismal regeneration, which uh, thankfully most of them don't. So now you have, you have covenant, so-called covenant children who don't have covenant faith. Mm -hmm. I think that's a clear violation of the, of the, of the new covenant and a misunderstanding of the new covenant. So um, it's interesting, you know, in that regard, covenant theologians become a little bit like dispensationalists with the land, right? They revert to the Old Testament. Dispensationalists revert to the Old Testament when it comes to the land, because I think that land promise is fulfilled in Christ, finally in the new heavens and new earth. But dispensationalists, they say the Old Testament controls basically how we understand the land promise. Covenant theologians, when it comes to baptism, say circumcision controls how we understand the fulfillment of the promise. And I, th I think that's... A mistake. I think they actually make the same mistake, but just in different areas. 
Do you think some of the confusion is because they talk about the covenant of grace in singular rather than seeing a development, a progression within the covenants so they don't see what's new about the new covenant and we're basically pretty much the same as Abraham? Yes, ex exactly. I think that's exactly it. They don't, David, they don't see, they don't see the, uh, the progression in the covenants. They, they make the mistake of thinking the Abrahamic covenant is exactly the same as the new covenant. The new covenant fulfills the covenant with Abraham and the covenant with Moses, but there is a progression. Hence the name, right? Progressive, yeah. Yeah. progressive covenantalism. Then the other thing I just mentioned briefly is, so I, the, where does this show up? I'm not a Sabbatarian. I mean, mm -hmm. I have great respect for Sabbatarians, but so it shows up in the law. You know, the, typically covenant theologians will say all 10 commandments are authoritative as they were in the old covenant. But I would argue that the, that Mosaic covenant, what does the New Testament teach? The, the Mosaic mm -hmm. covenant has passed away. We're not under that covenant anymore. And the sign of the covenant was the Sabbath. So, um, so and then the Sabbath is on Saturday. So Christians, as, as, and the Sabbath, so if we look at it redemptive historically, the Sabbath is fulfilled first in Christ. Come to me all you are weary and heavy laden, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. The Sabbath points to, typologically points to Jesus. And that Sabbath rest, Hebrews chapter 4, is fulfilled finally in the new creation, where we rest from our works, and we enter God's heavenly, heavenly rest. And I think Paul says, look, the Sabbath is a shadow. Uh, Colossians 2, verse 16, the substance belongs to Christ. You know, that word is the very same word Paul uses of Old Testament sacrifices. Uh, not Paul, mm -hmm. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Old Testament sacrifices are a skia. They're a shadow. They're yep. the same word Paul uses in Colossians about the Sabbath. So the Sabbath points to something. So, you know, what does Paul say in Romans 14? He says, look, different opinions on the Sabbath, fine. But I, I even think that is interesting theologically because, and I want to say a little bit more about this, he wouldn't say that about adultery, right? He wouldn't say, some of you think adultery is wrong, some of you think it's okay, let everyone be fully convinced in their own mind. Mm -hmm. but that's what he says about days, which I think he clearly has the Sabbath in mind. So I think Paul says, yeah, you can hold whatever view you want, but even saying that shows he's not a Sabbatarian. So, so how do you understand Sunday, uh, first day of the week, and a day of rest now? Uh... Yes, yes. Uh, so I would say Sunday is not the Sabbath. Sunday, we have hints of this in the New Testament. Sunday is the Lord's Day. Hmm. Christians gathered on the Lord's Day to worship. And I think that ought to be a priority for believers. I do think, however, you think of what it was like in the early Roman Empire. The Christians on Sunday, they and, worked. <laughs> they worked. It's a blessing not to work. I don't work on Sundays. But I think they worked and they met either early in the morning or late at night after work. I mean, that, that was the reality because the Roman Empire recognized the Jewish Sabbath, by the way, but they did not recognize Christians worshiping on Sunday. And why did Christians worship on Sunday? It was the day Jesus was risen from the dead. So should we rest? Yes, we need to be wise. To work all the time is not good. It, 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 does it have to be one particular day? I don't think so. Any, anybody who works all the time and doesn't rest, it's foolish, and you'll experience the consequences. But I don't, I don't think there's a legal code telling you when to do it. So the, one other thing I want to say is people say, well, what about the other commandments? Say, don't murder. Why are they authoritative if we're not under the Mosaic law? And I would say hermeneutically, those commandments are repeated in the New Testament as authoritative. So how do we know they're authoritative? Well, at the end of the day, we know because Romans 13, 8 through 10, other mm -hmm. passages, the Bible says so. But then theologically, why are they normative? And my argument is they're not normative because they're part of the Mosaic Covenant. 
that covenant has passed away. They're normative because they reflect the will of God. And we're not surprised. We're not surprised that some of the commands in the Mosaic law reflect the will of God. And if I could say one other thing about this, here I agree, I mentioned Don Carson. So Don, Don's really, we, we hold the same view. I'm sure my view is influenced by his. Don's older than I am. But Don recently wrote an essay in which he said, do we believe the moral law is authoritative? And he said, unlike covenant theologians, we don't hold that view a priori, but a posteriori. And I thought that was a helpful distinction by which Don meant we don't, we don't assume that just covenantally. We draw that conclusion after we read the New Testament. Hmm. It's a conclusion from reading the data. We say, hey, the, the moral norms of the law, they, they're still uh, binding on us today. So we're very close. That's, uh, that's where I started. We're very close to covenant theologians and our understanding of the law, but there's a couple adjustments at the end of the day. Those adjustments though right. matter because they relate to baptism and they relate to uh, how you view uh, Sunday. Yep. You know, Greg Beale, uh, Greg's a good friend of mine and I, I love Greg's work. Greg has written on, uh, he says, yes, we observe the Sabbath, we go to church on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Greg's a Presbyterian, but I say that Greg, that is not the covenant theology view. You read the Old Testament, you don't work on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole testament says hardly anything about worshiping on the Sabbath. It's all about work. Greg seems, and I and I love Greg to death. I'd love to talk to him about it. We've done a conference together, but I'd love to talk to Greg about this sometime and say. I don't understand how you think you can work on Sunday and still be a Presbyterian. <laughs> so, but he, I'm sure Greg has an answer. He always does. He, he's been the biggest help to me in, in, on teaching Revelation. Um, yeah. He's been a real blessing in my life. And, uh, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I want, to, I want to change questions a little bit, a little less heavy now, more educational, less theological. Um, I want to know, you know, you've been many years, um, many decades now teaching at the undergraduate and at the graduate level. You're now um, also dean of the School of Theology at, at Southern Baptist. Associate dean. Associate dean. Sorry. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Associate dean. Uh, that leaves you time for writing probably. Um, I, want, I want to know what your... What your view of uh, what's the state of theologian in the world now, um, and what hope do you think is there, or how do you see the future in the coming years of theologian in the world? Uh, do you have a take on that? Uh, are you encouraged? Are you discouraged? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm. In, I'm. Well, first of all, I'd say I'm encouraged. I mean, you know, talking to you, uh, some of my students are. I have a student teaching in the Philippines. I have a student teaching in Malawi, um, students in other countries, that some I can't even name. Mm. But I'm really encouraged. I think there is uh, worldwide good teachers who love God's word, who are theologically faithful, who care about truth, who are who are teaching uh, theologically, of, so and and exegetically and building up the church, and they believe, they believe in truth. They believe the way the church grows is through the word of God. They they don't just say that. I mean, a lot of people say that, right? But they actually practice it, and they, yeah. they and and they're uh, shaping and forming their students, and then their students are having a great impact. So that's really encouraging. I mean, there's a big change going on in the United States, probably where you are too. And that is the biggest change is online. Yep. Uh, that is a big and dramatic change. I think it's second best, but it's better than nothing. And you can do some things online you can't do other ways. I still believe always life on life incarnational ministries, the best. I mean, we're a very large school, but I have 
I have close relationships with my doctoral students, especially because we have a residential program. So mm -hmm. you know, I, for example, we have lunch together, you know, six to eight times a year, all of us together. And then I meet with them individually. But if it's online, you, you, you can't do that, right? So, but on the other hand, I want to say there's blessings to online education as well, that we can reach uh, people and areas that we couldn't reach without it. So I'm, I'm old. <laughs> mm. I'm 66 years old. I like the old way best. Um, but I see, you know, big changes are coming about. I, I just pray and hope we use that technology well and wisely. S young students, they need mentors, good mm -hmm. mentors who are in their lives, not, not, just, not just digitally, but in person. So I think it's really important if, if we're doing more online education, that they're with pastors or mentors wherever they are, who are helping them and share the same vision we share, because uh, otherwise, otherwise it could it, it could become a little bit more like just feeding information in the people's sure. head, sure. and that's that's not uh, that's not ideal. One thing I've really seen at the seminary, so we have we have surrounding the seminary some really wonderful churches. And I, a lot of our students will say after being in these churches that they learned as much or more being in the churches than they did in our seminary. So that's, that, you know, it's nice having the two together physically, geographically in the same place. Again, that's harder to do online because they're, I mean, I may not know anything about the church that person's in. Sure. Whereas here, you know, a lot of my students are also in my church. So that is wonderful because I see them in, in more than one in one place. I was uh, I was the preaching pastor in the church from 1998 to through 2016. Hmm. So um, I stepped down, you know, just as our church grew larger, and of course I was um, in my 60s. I thought it was a good time for a transition anyway. But you know that marriage together of the church and theological education. And, and, and maybe we're going to see more of that. I don't know. You know, what's going to happen governmentally in the United States will, will, uh, and maybe other places, but at least for us, I don't know other countries' laws in the same way, but we may lose tax-exempt status. Yep. Our big schools, who knows what's coming. Then, then if that happens, at least in the United States, I could see schools becoming much more church-based. And, and, mm -hmm. That could be a good thing. The, 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 the only disadvantage is, I, I've really seen this over here, for people to know, to know their field well, you need some experts. Mm -hmm. You know, in church history and theology, Old and New Testaments, it's helpful to have some people who are up on, up on what's happening in scholarship. And most churches just can't afford that. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Well, springboarding off, off what the comments you just made, i um, going to jump down a little bit, uh, take advantage of uh, your comments on this subject. Throughout your ministry, you've been very, very close to the local church. And um, as mentioned, for 18 years, you were a preaching pastor, and um, now you're one of the elders of your church. So how important is it that, that pastors be scholars and that scholars function like pastors that is that they're you know they're they're involved in the local church they're involved in the the day-to-day -day ministry with people H how important is that yeah i i i think i think jim that's absolutely absolutely vital um so if you're a scholar um say say uh i mean some people are very technical scholars right they work on text criticism so, you, you know, I think that's important. The fruit of that's not going to be evident to most people, but, but it will filter down, and that's great. But that scholar must be careful not to I isolate himself. So he must, at the same time, it is very important that, uh, that uh, they are involved in the church and uh, not, not just in their study all the time. 
because uh, for for their own spiritual life, for one thing, uh, I think that's uh, that's very important. I, I want to. I do want to say that that's been one of my great joys of teaching at Southern. Our 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 faculty has a great emphasis on being involved in the local church and. And a number of our professors are, are also pastors, um, some of them full-time, some of them part-time. And even if they're not pastors, they're, they're very involved in the church. So if those who are in the academic arena, it's, it's crucial to be involved in the church. And as you said, I mean, I haven't been on staff now for four years, I, but I'm, a, I'm still an elder. And still, you know, when, and uh, when I'm in town, well, now I'm in town all the time. I teach Sunday school, but now with COVID, I'm not teaching Sunday school because we don't have it. So, <laughs> um, so well, hopefully we'll get back to those things. Now, in terms of uh, should pastors be scholars? Well, yes, no, and yes. I mean, no, no, pastors don't have to have a PhD, right? Pastors pastors uh, don't have to know all the details of scholarship, but pastors need to be learning. Mm -hmm. pastors, pastors need to study hard and know, and know God's word and, and learn from the fruit of scholarship. And some pastors, you know, John Piper has a PhD. Mark Ever has a PhD. I take it your listeners would know who Mark is. Yeah, you know, do you need a PhD to be a good pastor? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You don't need one. You don't have to have one. Sometimes we get students who they say to me, "I need a PhD to be a pastor," and I always say, "No, you don't. <laughs> you, you can profit from a PhD. It can it, it can help you in your ministry, but you don't have to have one." And uh, then maybe that's part of our culture. But the but the other side I want to say is we need pastors who study. We need, we need pastors who know God's word. We don't need pastors who just go into the pulpit and wing it, and they haven't prepared, and they just say, oh, the Holy Spirit's going to bring to mind what's, what's helpful. I mean, the Holy Spirit can do that, but don't rely on him to do that regularly because <laughs> the Holy Spirit blesses hard work. And so, you know, we live in a complicated and complex world and, and we, you know, as I'm 66, I'm an impatient person. And so I've learned over and over again, I'm still learning. God's not in a hurry. I've always been in a hurry. God, and, and God's not in a hurry in the sense that we need, to, we need to digest things. We need to learn things. When I, was, when I went to seminary when I was 26 years old, I did not want to go. Because I wanted to be a pastor right away, and I thought seminary was a waste of time. And I said, I just want to go do ministry. And I actually believed, I was so young and arrogant, I actually believed the seminary professors were probably not very devoted to God. Because I thought to myself, what are they doing teaching in the seminary instead of ministering in the real world? I guess God has a sense of humor because that's what I'm doing now, right? <laughs> so, so, but I learned, I started learning right away. Wait a minute. There, these professors they are more godly than I am, and they know far more than I do. Their experience and their wisdom, I need that. And I need to, instead of just spouting off, I need to study these things. Now, you know, pastors' lives are complex. There's a lot going on. We do the best we can in the time we have. Now, none, none of us does everything perfectly. I mean, I was pastoring and teaching, and I have four, had four kids, you know, and married and so life's life's complicated and you know when i came on as pastor i said to the church i will prepare my sermons one day a week and i said i'll do the best i can in one day but obviously if i had more time i could have done better so we recognize we do the best we can in the time because we have because we got to we've got to minister to our families our our wives all the different communities, but we ought not to forsake studying. Studying is very important. Excellent. Okay, great. Appreciate that. Um, I want to get theological again a little bit. Um, you've written a lot on biblical theology, uh, biblical theology, the Old Testament, New Testament. Um, and 
you consider that the kingdom of God is the central theme of the Bible, if I'm, if I'm right. Um, could you explain a little bit why and what that means um, for understanding the Bible? Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I think, a, I think a nice place to begin is what is the kingdom of God? It's God's rule. God is Lord. You know, it, Would you say kingdom is maybe a misnomer or not the best term for it? Uh, we think of kingdom as the United Kingdom, the kingdom of Belgium, the kingdom of Thailand as a, a place, a geographical place. Do you think that that's unhelpful? Or, or? No, no. Well, I would like to say for kingdom, I think three things. God, God, God's, God's rule, right, over God's people in God's place. So I think there is a place. I mean, even we're the place, right? So God's rule over God's people in, in God's place. Of course, well, I mean, we could say God's rule over the whole universe, can't we? So, I mean, I, I think the way Genesis begins, Adam and Eve were to rule the world under God's lordship. They were commissioned to be God's vice regents, by which I mean they were to exercise dominion, they were to cultivate the world uh, for the glory of, of God. And, 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 and they failed in that, didn't they? They didn't, they, they didn't trust God and, and obey him. So you, you can say the story of the Bible, in a sense, I mean, God, in one sense, God's sovereignty always reigns, he always rules over all. But in one sense, the story of the Bible is God's rec reclamation project, by which he reasserts his lordship over the world through the last Adam, uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus succeeds where Adam fails. Jesus is, is the obedient king. And I think that's very interesting in the covenants, right? I mean, the covenants, you know, in the Mosaic covenant, blessing comes to the one who obeys. And when God makes a covenant with David, he says, as long as your sons are obeying, uh, I'm going to bless the king. But if they disobey, I'll discipline them. Still, I will not withdraw my covenant with David. The, the dynasty uh, will, will uh, last forever. But, uh, but there's only one king who ends up being obedient, fully obedient, and that's Jesus. So he so the fulfillment of the covenants finally comes through an obedient covenant partner. And, uh, and of course, we get into the blessing of that uh, when we're united to, to, to our king uh, by faith. So that, I mean, I'm going all over the place, but the church of Jesus Christ, we're the place where God is ruling. We're God's kingdom and priests now. Israel in the Old Testament, right? They were God's kingdom, God's mm -hmm. priests. But now we're God's kingdom and God's priests. God exercises his rule in the world. He mediates blessing in the world as, as kingdom and priests through us. And that will be consummated at the second coming. There's a lot more I could say. I don't know if you want to follow up. Do, do you, I, I just want to see how that relates to the, the dispensational idea of uh, a millennial reign. Uh, they see that quite central at uh, 1,000 years, Jesus Christ literally on the earth reigning. Um, yeah. How does that fit or not fit into, into um, biblical theology of the kingdom of God? Yeah, um, well, the and of course, we talked about this uh, before, didn't we? Hmm. The dispensational view, uh, David, is that you'll have a 1,000 years where Jesus is reigning from Jerusalem, and, and the Jewish people are, are sort of at the center of that rule. I disagree with that. Hmm. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it fits with, uh, you know, Revelation 20 says nothing about that. Absolutely nothing. Hmm. Absolutely yeah. nothing about Israel. Um, so, but then, you know, you have post-millennialists. I'm not, I mean, I'm not convinced of post-millennialism. I actually, I always say to my classes, I wish post-millennialism. <laughs> I mean, that'd be the greatest of all. You know, and I'd, I'd love post-millennialism as an idea. But, it's um, nice to be an optimist. Exactly, exactly. It, I, I don't think it's exegetically very uh, persuasive. And then uh, most people would say it doesn't, doesn't seem to be going in that direction. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But then there's historic premillennialism and amillennialism. Historic premillennialism believes there'll be a, a, a Christ reigning on earth with his saints, either for a thousand years, or maybe that number's symbolic or for a significant period of time. Amillennialism, Christ from the time of the cross, resurrection, and exaltation, Christ is reigning with his saints, at least this is the, the most popular view of amillennialism today. He reigns with his, with his saints in heaven, the saints who have died. And uh, so the millennium lasts until the second coming, right? For premillennialism, the millennium is uh, after the second coming. So I think that, honestly, I, I think it's really difficult to tell whether historic premill or amill is correct. You know, those go back to the early church. You can see that uh, Papias, Irenaeus, and Justin Martyr, they were clearly all historic. They weren't dispensationalists, mm. but they were clearly historic premillennialists. But then, then you had uh, others who were uh, very early on uh, all millennialists. And I always say to my students, you know, the, the debates have lasted, uh, the debates have lasted a really long time because Eusebius and, and Eusebius talking about the millennium and Eusebius is all millennial. Eusebius says about Papias, he says... He didn't have a very high opinion of him. <laughs> yeah, he says he has, he's, he's obviously not an intelligent person. <laughs> he's, actually, he's actually pretty dumb because he took these prophecies literally. So, you know, I always say, yeah, these millennial debates are thousands of years old. So I think really good arguments can be made in favor of historic pre-mill and amill. And I've gone back and forth I slightly, tentatively, hesitantly, uncertainly incline towards Amel, amillennialism. But I think Revelation 20 gives me pause. But the whole, everything else I read in the Bible makes me think Amel, everything else. So I just think, well, Revelation 20 is an apocalyptic passage. I think. I think all millennialists can have a good explanation of that passage that fits. So, but I, I feel a tension there. There, there are some features in that text that make me wonder. So, hmm. very interesting. I agree with you. Before we uh, <laughs> tentatively <laughs> get any deep, deeper into this, um, I want to switch gears just a little bit. I appreciate that, that explanation. It was really helpful. Uh, you've written two books on Perseverance of the Saints. Uh, one you co-wrote with Ardell Kennedy, and then about, I think, nine or ten years later, was it uh, you wrote uh, sort of a follow-up? I think it was based on some of the responses that you received. Is that correct? To That's correct. The first book? That's correct. And then you also submitted a, uh, had one of the, ch authored one of the chapters in um, the book on the role of works uh, in the final judgment. So what about this, this subject is um, so urgent? Why, what motivated you to, to write so extensively on the subject? And how do you see its importance in the church today? Yeah. Yeah, that subject is near and dear to my heart. Ardell Kennedy, when I was at Bethel Seminary, Ardell Kennedy taught at Northwestern. And we had many long walks we would take these long walks and talk about these passages and the, so, such fascinating times. I learned a lot from Ardell. But I think the motivation there, I mean, obviously it's exegetical, but uh, my concern was a kind of easy believism that I saw in many evangelical circles. So, Right, I told you I came from Catholicism, and in Catholicism, right, when you're baptized, you're a Christian, supposedly, allegedly. Obviously, I don't believe that at, at infancy. But then I began to see, in some evangelical circles, it can be quite popular, if you've made a decision, if you've gone forward, if you've prayed a prayer, 
in a way, it can be as sacramental as a Roman Catholic view. That people would, people would say, well, I, I prayed a prayer, I made a decision, I went forward, I'm saved. And uh, my concern is, I, clearly, we're not saved on the basis of works. We're saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, because I believe God demands perfection. And the, the only ground of our assurance is the imputed righteousness of Christ. I wrote a book, Faith Alone, where I emphasize, yeah, we're saved by faith alone. And, the, and our faith, it isn't faith that ultimately saves us, but it's faith in Christ. It's God who saves us, and it's the righteousness of Christ that uh, is our assurance on the day of death. I always tell the story of J. Gresham Machen, the founder of Westminster Seminary in 1929 and the founder of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. When Machen was dying in North Dakota, in his, or maybe it was South Dakota, but in his 50s, he was laying there dying, and he said, thank God for the act of obedience of Christ. No hope without it. By which he meant, thank God that my righteousness isn't dependent ultimately on my works. Thank God that my righteousness is dependent on what Jesus Christ has done for me. Yes, 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 yes to all of that. That is vital, vital. But my, our concern in, these, in, in the first book and the second book was uh, true faith manifests itself in works and perseverance. Faith, as James says, faith without works is death. And so it if, uh, if I were to say, which isn't true, right? But if I were to say, which would be impossible, I'm, I've never even been in Peru, but I, uh, well, you and you guys are in different places yourselves, right? But if I were to say I had a bomb planted in the room there and it was going to go off in 60 seconds and you believed what I said and you wanted to live, you'd leave. <laughs> Faith leads to works, right? You do something. So... Faith, faith, is, uh, faith is receptive in one sense, but in another sense, it's very dynamic. And so that's, that's what we wanted to demonstrate. I wrote that second book because some people were saying, oh, you believe we have to, you believe we have to persevere. You believe we have to be perfect. You believe we have to be without sin. You believe, you really believe in work salvation. And uh, honestly, I think it's all there in the first book that we don't say that. But I thought, okay, and, and that second book I gave is lectures in various places uh, and, and churches and schools. But I said, okay, I'm going to write another book because I want to make crystal clear perseverance isn't perfection. You know, and I, I always use the example of Peter. Peter persevered, but he denied Christ. Well, he repented, right? He didn't just deny Christ and say, okay, that's it, I'm done with Jesus, but I'm still saved. Yeah, denying Christ is a terrible thing, but he denied Christ and repented. And then he walked with Jesus again, didn't he? So obviously we don't ever want to encourage sin, but we know from reading the Bible, you can commit horrific sins and be forgiven. But that, but that, uh, that rep but such forgiveness is predicated on real repentance, not just saying, well, I guess I'll go commit adultery tonight, and then I'll ask to be forgiven. <laughs> and, uh, and as if it's some kind of contractual matter, and then you just keep living with this other woman or whatever, and say, well, I'm saved. So that, that was our concern. The other thing I'd want to say is the way we interpret the warning passages in Hebrews is those, and not just in Hebrews, many other passages, God's warnings about not falling away are a means he uses to keep us on the right road. And so, and we all need those means. So one of the means God uses, it's not the only means, Maybe it's not even the primary means, but one of the means he uses to keep us trusting him until the end is to say, if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. That's a warning. 
Mm-hmm. Jesus says, if you do not, if you fully and finally deny me, because Peter denied him, but he didn't fully and finally deny him, right? If you deny me, I'll deny you on the last day. And the way that works in the lives of true believers, we say, when we hear that warning, I don't want to deny Jesus. I love Jesus. I don't want to deny him. I, I, uh, I embrace him. And Lord, give me, give me courage and give me strength to confess Jesus before others. I thought it was really how helpful. important do you think, sorry, how, how important do you think this is for the church in a, in a practical, in well, a practical I think, sense? I think it's so important because I think too many churches don't preach any of the warning passages. They, mm-hmm. they just, they, because they'll say, oh, that's not, that's not according to the gospel. Right. You know, that's legalism or something like that. Um, and then they miss out on a great blessing. I thought it was very, very helpful in the book how you clearly demonstrate that the warning passages are real. And you stressed that, you know, if they're not real, then they have no bite. And if they have no bite, why are they there? Yeah. Yeah. But they're very real warning passages. And that the purpose of the warning was not to say you're already fallen in, in the hole, now get yourself out, but rather they were preemptive to say there's a hole in, you know, in the road ahead of you, be aware. Yeah, and I and I thought that that was really, really a helpful perspective to see the warning passages in a new light, and yet allow them to have the full force that they were intended to have. Yeah. So now I think this is really interesting. I just taught this this week. Most people, most reformed people, even they preach Hebrews six as a call to introspection. Right. Am I really a Christian? And I said to the class. There are passages that do that, but I don't think this passage is doing that. It's not calling you to say, am I a Christian? It's calling you to keep following Jesus. It's not calling you to doubt yourself. It's calling you to trust Jesus and not let him go. So that's a very different way of preaching uh, that text. And And I think there are some passages that call us to examine ourselves but I think most of the passages, if we look at the scriptures as a whole, don't call us to be introspective, but to look to Christ, mm. right? Finally, if that makes sense. Yes, I'm, I see the same thing with the Lord's Supper. The emphasis in the evangelical church, especially in Latin America, is the Lord's Supper is an exercise in Protestant confessional you know, introspection, how bad am I? How have I messed up? Instead of looking to Christ as the sustenance and the bread of life. And so, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a really, really important point that you're, that you're making. Yeah. And I think in first Corinthians 11, Paul's saying, look, examine yourself. I mean, it's something rather obvious. They're getting drunk at the Lord's supper. It's not, It's not, you know, because I've had Christians say to me, well, I didn't take the Lord's Supper because there's some sin in my life. And I'm like, well, there's sin in all of our lives, right? But are you, are you holding on to it? Are, are, do you have some secret sin right now you're indulging in and you're not confessing and, and by God's grace trying to overcome? You know, you should be taking the Lord's Supper. This isn't, it becomes almost... You know, it becomes almost a little bit Catholic, like you, you got to be perfect almost, to, which is, I, I think, really contrary to what's going on. Yeah. That, isn't that what the Lord's Supper is for, for sinners? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We're, we're, we're running out of time now, so I just want just one final quick question, and then, and then we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, what, what advice would you have for, some, for a young person specifically, maybe in Latin America, who wants to grow theologically and grow in godliness, but doesn't have access to a formal seminary education? What, what steps could they take or should they be taking to, to grow in their knowledge of God and their obedience to him? What would you suggest? If I could just add one thing, not only doesn't have a formal education, that they lack the 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 resources, yeah. you know, the, the library, the um, healthy churches, some of the resources that we in North America really take for granted. Mm. 
Yeah, that's a good question. You got you probably could answer that better than I could. But the first thing I'd say, but it's not available to everyone, the most important thing for anybody is to be involved, hopefully in a good church. You know, being vitally involved in your local church, that's just fundamental. Now, I mean, I know even in the United States, not every community doesn't have a good church. That's By a good church, I mean a church that is preaching expositionally through scripture and is has good theology. Um, yeah, so, and if you don't have that, now if you have really limited resources, I'm just trying to think really practically. I mean, I would try to get something like the ESV study Bible. Hmm. I mean, if you can't afford very much, there's a, there are a lot of riches in that ESV study Bible. I mean, if you could only have one book, maybe, you know, because you have the Bible and then you have the study notes. Or I think maybe it'd be most important to get a really good systematic theology. And it's hard. I don't know. It's hard for me to decide which one I think is best because in part I disagree with all of them, right? I mean, I'm I don't know where you stand on some of these issues, but I'm, so I love Wayne Grudem, but I'm a cessationist and he's a continuationist. I think Wayne's book is very good. It's very accessible to people. But I think, you know, if you have very limited resources, Wayne's book is very good. And then maybe I'd supplement it with uh, John Frame's Systematic Theology, which I think is uh, extraordinarily helpful. But I'm I, usually, I usually say to my students, don't, don't buy a commentary on the Bible, buy two. And don't buy, so don't buy one theology, buy two. And when you see the differences, that's when you get thinking. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The good thing, Grudem, Grudem is in Spanish, but uh, Frame is not in Spanish. Frame is not in Spanish. Oh, right. that's too bad. Oh, that surprises me a little bit just because he's uh, so well published. So, well, I guess if I'm, I'm not, if I'm not wrong, I think it's in process of being translated at the moment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'd say off the top of my head. I mean, you, you, with your experience, I think you could answer that question better than I could. Well, appreciate we appreciate your time. It's been it's been really nice. Um, we, you need uh, need to go away now. But it's been really nice speaking to you, learning from you, from your experience, from your knowledge, and uh, it's been for me. It's been a, a real pleasure and um, learn from your wisdom. And we do pray that the Lord would uh, bless, continue to bless your life, your, your family, and your ministry, which is, is uh, huge in its in impact around the world. So uh, we really thank you for your time, um, Dr. Schreiner. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, David and Jim. It's been great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bueno, well, hermanos, amigos, que nos han acompañado esta hora con el doctor Thomas Schreiner. Espero que la hayan disfrutado. Espero que hayan, estoy seguro que han aprendido mucho en este tiempo, igual que, igual que yo. Y uh, acuérdense que los centros teológicos bautistas estamos um, a su disposición para su capacitación, su educación teológica, para ayudarte a servir al Señor y aprender um, más sobre Dios y sobre su palabra. Así que contáctanos si tienes algún interés en estudiar con nosotros. Muchas gracias por su atención. En otra oportunidad tendremos otra entrevista, otra conversación, um, Dios mediante. Muchas gracias y buenas noches.